organizers for organizing this very nice conference and giving me the opportunity to speak here. So as you heard, I'm going to talk about constant intrinsic character surfaces in ADS CFD. And I want to start my talk with a little a posteriori motivation for why I'm doing all of this. And that's what I want to call the who's question. So um, while I was kind of reading the literature on these topics that I uh, found myself working on, I came across this quote by the French mathematician Dabou, who wrote uh, about 130 years ago um, concerning the geometry of sub-manifolds. So we're talking about like two dimension one hypersurfaces embedded into a larger ambient space time. And he wrote, it can be said that the total curvature, that means intrinsic curvature or Gauss curvature, has more importance in geometry. In mathematical physics, on the contrary, it is the mean curvature, so the extrinsic curvature, which seems to play the dominant role. And this quote fascinated me because it is so long ago, and yet, at least in my specific research field, the ads 3 t correspondence, this still holds to very, very clearly to this day. Uh, specifically in ATS-CFT, its um, extremal surfaces, which have vanishing uh, mean curvature, play very important roles in things like the so-called new Takanaki formula, or other applications like description of Blitzen loops or the so-called complexity equals volume proposal. So um, I, I want to define what I'm going to call the Bruce question in ADS-CFT. Namely, two surfaces of constant intrinsic curvature also have any role to play in ADS-CFT, and if yes, uh, which one? So this is uh, kind of what I want to put at the beginning of my talk. And um, maybe it's time for me to explain what is ADS-CFT. So um, ADS-CFT uh, is called the ADS-CFT correspondence. If you want to be more honest, you can call it the ADS-CFT conjecture. Um, and this conjecture posits that the physics of certain conformal field theories, which we call CFT or the boundary, can be equivalently encoded in the gravitational physics of a higher dimensional anti sitter or asymptotically anti sitter space, which we call ADS or the bulk. So here you have this little picture. You can use a coordinate system where ADS is mapped to like the inside of a cylinder. So a slice of ADS looks like a hyperbolic disk. And then the CFT is kind of understood to live on the boundary of the cylinder. And um, what makes this correspondence work is what we call the uh, holographic dictionary. And here this holographic dictionary, mathematical problems of the boundary theory may be translated into a problem in the bulk theory or the other way around, where a solution may be easier or where a new perspective on the problem may emerge. And I'm going to give you two examples of how this holographic dictionary works. The first example is going to be this one thing that I've already alluded to, the so-called new Tagayanagi formula. So if we uh, imagine that we have this CFT that is supposed to live on this boundary here, we can look at a subregion of that CFT, which we call A. And then we can calculate something which is called the entanglement entropy of that subregion. Essentially, we calculate the um, reduced density matrix in the uh, row A, and the von Neumann entropy of that is called the entanglement entropy. This expression here is an entirely a uh, von Computer kind of expression. And this holographic dictionary relates the left hand side of this equation with the right hand side, which is an expression uh, that makes sense in terms of the geometry of this bulk gravity theory. So here we calculate the area of an extremal surface that um, goes through the bulk but is anchored on the boundary at the um, end points of this interval A. And then calculating the area of the surface dividing by 4GN gives us this entropy. That's essentially a generalization of the uh, entropy formula for black holes that you know. Um, and formally, of course, both of these quantities are divergent. So what we do is we have to introduce a cutoff. And then interestingly, uh, what looks like a short distance UV cutoff in field of field language turns out to be uh, IR cutoff in the gravity language where we regularize this infinite volume divergence. So this is one example of the dictionary, and it's one example of how uh, the extrinsic curvature plays a role in ADCFT, a very prominent role. So coming back to the question that I defined earlier on. The second example of the holographic dictionary that I want to define is the so-called uh, GKDW formula, 
which relates the um, generating function out of this quantum field theory, the dips on the boundary here, with the on shell action of the gravitational theory in the bike, subject to certain boundary conditions, uh, in a settled point approximation. So this also shows how important here that bulk action, action can be in the ATS CFD correspondence. Good. So with that kind of introduction out of the way, uh, we can now look at another concept which is called path integral optimization. So um, uh, path integral optimization is an idea that was pioneered, among others, by Pavel Kakuna, who is uh, now in Warsaw. So this is partially a Polish invention. And uh, it's a bit uh, hard to explain. The idea is to look at the quantum field theory and kind of try to reformulate it in a way such that um, you can uh, see that this is equivalently described by a theory that naturally lives on a hyperbolic space. Because as I showed you earlier on, ADS in the pile has these hyperbolic slices. And uh, with this, the idea is to explain the emergence of the hyperbolic bulk geometry from a manipulation of the boundary particle. Well. So this is a very, very ambitious idea um, that aims at better understanding how ATS safety works uh, fundamentally. So and Pavel kind of helped to invent this, and he continued um, uh, exploring this idea more and more over the recent years, including with his group and his students in Warsaw. So they had some further developments right recently, where they looked at um, um, the action between the boundary cutoff surface, uh, which would be here, and the bulk surface, Q, which would be here. So the space function M is what they want to look at. And then uh, calculate the value of X minus with respect to the scale factor, to a scale factor of the metric of Q. Um, that's kind of the things that they looked at in these papers. And then, unfortunately, there were some conceptual problems persisting concerning the switch from the Euclidean to the Lorentzian case. And around the same time, like 2020, 2021, um, together with a number of co-authors, I was also looking at a similar setup. So to be concrete, we considered um, uh, ADS3, where you can write on this line element. So here, set is like an inverse radial coordinate, such that this boundary is at set equals to zero. And now we introduce two time slices at initial and final time. Um, where the cutoff value is different. So it's set i and it's set f. And holographically, we would expect these to correspond to CFT bounds and it's that are caused by two different cutoffs. And um, we kind of connect these two states by the surface in the, in the bundle, which has some profile set a function equals the function rho of t. And we, we assume, for simplicity, uh, translation invariance in the x direction. You know, this, this the direction. And now we make a proposal, kind of a guess, um, namely that the complexity of the kind of quantum circuit that maps this one initial state to the final state is given by the gravitational action on them. Now, this term complexity has a lot of baggage and history in the uh, holography literature. Unfortunately, I'm not going to have time to explain it in great detail. For the moment, all that you need to know is complexity is something that we want to externalize. You know, like the principle of least action, but with a different kind of thing. And carrying out this calculation is actually uh, relatively easy. So I'm going to show you this uh, first example. Again, this is the line element for the Euclidean ADS. We write down the pilot action for the gravitational theory. We have einstein Hilbert term, cosmological constant. We have kind of surface terms, uh, given swapping type, and there are certain showing terms where surfaces of a different uh, type uh, come together. <coughs> um, and um, so again, this is the sketch of what we're doing. If you evaluate everything as a functional of this function rho of t, you get this value for the action, and now you externalize, and you get equations of motion that take this form. Uh, and you can solve them. Interestingly, the, the solutions are semicircular arcs of a certain radius r, and you know this hyperbolic equal time slice would be uh, obtained in the limit where this radius r goes to infinity. So this is a very simple calculation that we were interested in. But um, obviously, we made a lot of symmetry assumptions, so we were interested in generalizing this and understanding it better. So this led us to dividing what we call these generic flow equations. 
um, to, um, to remind you, essentially the problem that we are posing for ourselves is simply we take a fixed background, and so that, uh, we take the gravitational action, we don't vary with respect to the dynamical metric, we take the metric fixed, and then we have a surface Q and we calculate the value of the action enclosed inside of the surface Q, and then we uh, do variations of the surface and we want, this, um, we want to figure out uh, under which conditions on the surface this is going to be stationary. So we want to the equations of motion for the surface, not for the bulk metric. And um, in general, you can just write down the metric in an ABM formalism like this. So we are, here we have the expression of the Lagrangian. Here KFN is the extrinsic curvature tensor. And uh, this calculation was made mostly done by uh, Jan de Boer, who was co-authored here on these papers. And now you, you say, uh, suppose initially the surface Q is placed at constant uh, radial volume at R. So um, our variation would be to move it uh, to R plus some epsilon of X, the other coordinates. Then we can show the variation of the section takes this form. And consequent, consequently, equations of motion for the surface Q take this form. So, now we ask ourselves, what's the physical meaning of these equations? And maybe at this point it's good to uh, collect uh, ourselves and remind ourselves of the notation. So we're talking about like a four-dimensional one hypersurface. It has an induced metric that we call little g, and that's mn, the empty space metric, one dimension larger. We call the bulk metric, which is capital G in the new. And then we have, for example, the extrinsic curvature tensor and its trace. Also, the uh, Ricci scalar curvature of the ambient space we call curvy R, and the uh, induced uh, Ricci scalar curvature of this induced metric we call uh, regular R. So, what do we do with these equations? Um, the most straightforward thing would be a brute force answer. So you just say, okay, uh, my function, my coordinate set for this function Q is described by a function f of t and x, the other coordinates, then I calculate these extensive curvatures, and I plug this in, and I get a lot of like, nonlinear PDEs for f. And this is only tractable in the symmetric setups where we use um, like, uh, like translation invariance as an assumption or so. So this doesn't really work. But actually, there's a more elegant approach, maybe in the, at least in vacuum space times. The Hamiltonian constraint looks like this. So if this is zero, it means that the, the scalar curvature of the surface has to be fixed. Uh, specifically, um, in the deeper three case, if we set our ABS with a um, cosmological constant to minus one, then this ambient space curvature scalar is minus six, and R, the induced Ricci uh, scalar, uh, turns out to be minus two. So this comes back to this double question that I formulated earlier on. Now we realize these equations of motion that we've been struggling with are solved by constant curvature surfaces with a very specific fixed value of the um, curvature. And now we can actually find a very apparently well-known uh, theorem. I'm going to start with the statement in like flat space, which is um, apparently um, very well-known. Uh, namely that all developable surfaces, that means uh, vanishing uh, 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 curvature, are ruled surfaces, which means surfaces that are foliated by straight lines, which in, terms, in turn are, of course, geodesics of this ambient space. However, the converse is not true, and not all ruled surfaces are actually developable. And, um, like, you know, this is, this is kind of a textbook on, on like, a hypersurface geometry. And then what we need is nothing but the kind of ABS generalization of this statement. So you can prove a theorem that the surfaces that we are looking at uh, with i equals minus 2 are foliated by curves which are geodesics in the ambient space where the curvature is minus 6. So with that knowledge, you can easily um, construct solutions to these uh, more complicated general equations that I uh, positive, even in the absence of uh, translation invariance in X. So, for example, here we still have this Euclidean AS3 background with this line element. Now uh, we can write out this, this surface here. Automatically, we know it 
will satisfy these equations of motion that we derive. Um, and uh, like obviously, even in the case where the translation invariance in X is, is broken. So this is very, very convenient. And I have a number of these examples. I'm going to skip some just for the sake of time. Um, as I said earlier on, one conceptual problem that always plagues these path uh, in of these immunization approaches in the recent work by Pablo also was going from the Euclidean case to the Lorentzian case. So let's try to do that. So we can write down Lorentzian AES3 with this kind of line element with a certain choice of uh, coordinates. And then, for example, a straight like surface that has certain boundary conditions you can easily construct with like this. It's also interesting to look at surfaces that are themselves uh, Lorentzian, like that have a time direction in the induced metric. So uh, this leads us to these surfaces which I have called elements, which are kind of like surfaces in Lorentzian ADS. Essentially in ADS we know that there, there are these geodesics, time-like geodesics, which kind of oscillate through the center of ADS periodically. Um, they can be written down in this Gaussian system in this form where E is a parameter you might call energy because, of course, ADS has killing vectors, so geodesics are going to have conserved quantities. And now if you make this E a uh, fine dependent function, you get this kind of expression, which is going to give you uh, a surface which will automatically satisfy these equations of motion that I have shown for any choice E of fine. And uh, this is what they look like, and now you understand why I call them lemons, because I put them in yellow, and they slightly look like a lemon. Um, and here you see th th these surfaces for all various possible choices, and different possible choices of this function, E of phi. So we can make a few um, observations, actually. First of all, um, all lemons, they, they have this uh, fixed height, in time coordinate, delta t equals pi. So they start at a conical singularity, and then they seem to expand and collapse again and end at a conical singularity. Um, um, the action calculated in the space enclosed inside of a element is 4 pi squared in units where we set uh, Newton's constant to 1 and things like that. So it's always the same value. Um, and uh, like this is for a constant e. Um, if you make e to be a real function, it looks like this. Um, you can do things like make e have imaginary values, and then what you get are these kind of field lemons where the surface turns space like and it reaches out and touches the boundary of ADS. In a particularly interesting example uh, uh, case, is also the limit where e goes to infinity everywhere. In that case, you get this, which is a, a null surface. And specifically, it's the null surface that bounds the so-called middle the bit patch, which is kind of a causal diamond inside of ADS. And this is a very, very important uh, region of the bulk geometry for a lot of um, applications in ADS CFT. Um, so it was interesting for us that we obtained this, especially because uh, I would say we obtained it in our construction uh, is a part of this family of solutions very naturally. If you read these uh, um, papers by our competitors, um, they also um, are very interested in obtaining the bit-to-bit -bit patch, but what they do is they introduce um, a kind of a tension term on the surface Q that they are working with, and then they are taking an infinite tension limit, which always felt a little bit um, ad hoc to me, and uh, I was happy that we get our bit-to-bit -bit patch without um, this kind of uh, limit. Um, another interesting question is, what should be the limit, uh, sorry, what should be the value of the gravitation action evaluated inside of this unit bit patch? That's actually a non-trivial problem. Based on this, you might say, okay, if I take the limit equals infinity and it's always constant, then this should also be the limiting value. But I'm not sure this limit is actually continuous in that sense. So, because calculating the action inside of regions with null boundaries um, requires different kind of boundary terms than the people talking York boundary term, for example, which is only really well defined for timeline or space like uh, um, boundaries. So this is an uh, interesting problem also. And um, uh, lastly, I want to um, 
give a little more mathematical outlook, namely about the possible connection to kinematic space and that. So as I have said, we, we kind of naturally arrive at these uh, flow equations, um, and the solutions of which are formulated by geodesics of the ambient space. And that means, mathematically, that these surfaces that I have presented can be formulated by themselves as curves in the space of geodesics, which in the holography context we often times call kinematic space. And this use of kinematic space methods uh, in holography has actually been pioneered by Bartek Czech, who is also a Polish scientist, but he's in, uh, working in China at the moment, I believe. Um, so this is a very interesting uh, connection, and it would be interesting in the future uh, to see whether we can phrase our results from a kinematic space perspective and whether that gives us any uh, new insights. So uh, with that, all said, I would uh, at this point actually like to summarize. And um, so to summarize, the groundwork for this, and the motivation for what we were doing was laid with this idea of parsonical optimization, a very ambitious program with hopes of like shedding light on how ABCFT actually works and comes into being. So based on that, we considered this variational problem of maximizing the bulk action uh, enclosed in a certain cutoff surface on a fixed background. And uh, we showed that the resulting flow equations uh, demand uh, you to work with like constant intrinsic sur uh, curvature surfaces. Hence, going back to this uh, boost question that I formulated earlier on. And um, because of that, we also have the methods to construct solutions to these equations very, very simply. And um, these results tie into earlier work in the holography context uh, surrounding notions like complexity, TT bar deformations, which unfortunately I didn't have time to explain very, very much, and these kinematic space methods. So, um, of course, I know that um, this is not a specialized ABS-CFT uh, conference, and maybe not most people aren't really familiar with this idea of complexity, which I have deliberately left vague. But um, I like conferences like this because the audience is very diverse, right? And um, I, I thought very carefully what should I present and I give a talk here. And I decided on this topic because um, uh, I want to learn something hopefully from the audience. So um, if you are working on a completely different sector of mathematical physics or variational physics, and you want to start a conversation later on uh, with me during the coffee break or let's say the, the lunch break, um, I would be very curious to hear whether you think that in whatever your research field is, this observation of the boom that uh, extrinsic curvature services, like with a defined extrinsic curvature, are more useful than those with a defined intrinsic curvature, whether that holds true in your research field or not, and uh, why or why not you think that is the case. So with that being said, um, I'm, uh, I'm now finished and I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention. Quantity in the field theory perspective captures this growth of the Einstein Rosen bridge 
Obviously, it can't be entropy, so entropy is not enough. So that was the motivation for defining this concept of complexity in introducing it uh, um, in uh, EPS CFT. Is it a general concept, or is it, uh, is it defined in some specific ways? Uh, of okay. Mathematical world? Yeah, so I have some uh, backup slides. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what is complexity? <laughs> <laughs> so very, very abstractly, what you mean by complexity is suppose you have some abstract evaluation where input state is mapped to some output state by a sequence of intermediate steps, and the complexity is the number of steps that you need. So, Simple example, you have a Rubik's cube, you solve it in three terms, then you can say the initial state had a complexity of three. If you have a quantum computer, you prepare your initial state, and then you operate on it with these gates, like Hadamard gates, C naught gates, stuff like that, you can say the number of these gates is going to be the complexity. Of course, that depends on your definition of your fundamental gate set, right? So there's a lot of like arbitrariness in the definition. And then there's Nielsen's idea of geometric complexity, where you say that you have a geometric space of states, and the, the, the transformation that turns input state to output state is like a path in that space. And now you define some kind of distance measure on this uh, uh, manifold, and then the length of this path is what you're going to call the complexity. So this is like a continuous idea. And um, yeah, so this is pretty much what I said. So you have gate complexity, number of gates, and then you know if you have input state and output state, you can define the relative complexity, and there's this geometric idea. And in holography, Suskin actually proposed two um, proposals for what quantities that he thinks might capture this behavior of complexity in the quantum field theory. So one was the so-called volume uh, equals complexity proposal, which I also mentioned earlier on because it is also based on like, extreme surfaces. But while Lille Kagenaki works with cool emission 2 extreme surfaces, uh, complexity equals volume works with cool emission 1 extreme surfaces. And the proposal was the volume of these surfaces that span through the bulb is going to be proportional in, uh, in some sense to this complexity. Uh, the other idea was the complexity equals action proposal, where they said, Okay, you should take the middle of the bit patch, so that comes the middle of the bit patch in, and you should evaluate the action inside of this little bit patch, and that would be a measure of complexity. So, um, so that was the proposal by Saskin, and you know, a number of years ago, and there has been a lot of further progress and uh, debate in this field. Um, I can talk about this forever, but I don't know what you know, your question is. Like, are you satisfied yeah. or? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your answer. This is uh, a general idea. Yes. Any more questions? Good. Since you are asking about feedback from people from the other area, there, there was a lot of activity in conformal geometry on definition of a normalized uh, area of various surfaces mm -hmm. asymptotic and uh, visitor space time. So I'm wondering whether those works are any useful for you. They typically consider minimal surface mm -hmm. rather than constant Okay. Good. Uh, it sounds good. But if you have a reference that you can give yeah, so, so the typical name you probably know is Robin Gray. Uh-huh. I think it's a little so good way then. Yeah. I mean people pronounce it usually graph. Okay. So that, like Graham, Fisherman Graham coordinates. Oh, okay. And we'll say it too. Okay, thanks. So I'll look at this. Thanks. If not, that's then we'll be good.